So the, the topic of this little 30 minute uh, introduction to today's uh, sessions is uh, largely to give a bigger picture of the Libreverse, uh, what it constitutes, why we're been pursuing it, uh, a little bit of its philosophy and some of the capabilities behind that. And more discussions of specific components of that will be addressed uh, um, again in the next uh, few hours. So the presentation overview is relatively simple. I want to give a little bit of the philosophy uh, and different topological uh, systems that one could uh, implement in trying to build a larger OER infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> and I'll be talking about the benefits and the attractions associated with that. And then largely, I'm going to go through the Libreverse, the individual components, talking about what they can do, where they're going, and uh, their utility for you as an adopter or as a student uh, uh, that's using it um, and such. So uh, let me start uh, with what I started uh, yesterday, uh, the LibreText mission. Again, we're implementing a community-built OER resource platform portal that's comprehensive and curated at multiple levels. So that means that we have uh, community OER, comprehensive nature, and curation. And those are all critical components in moving uh, our project forward. Uh, and you'll see that manifested in every aspect of how the LibreVest operates. So, so first, let me mention a little bit about my philosophy, or at least the way I view OER. So I'm a very much a glass is half full kind of guy. Uh, and I view OER from the uh, lens of conflict theory. Um, and largely, I see this conflict is between the existing commercial infrastructure, largely the publishers, uh, that have been dominating the uh, seas uh, for a long time, uh, and all the upstart uh, OER projects uh, that have been uh, supported or have been started uh, over the last uh, handful of years uh, that uh, is really quite great in order to see um, them grow. Um, and they're all over the place. Uh, and I'll be mentioning that again uh, in a few slides. But the key point is that if you're gonna be viewing OER as competition by taking away the impact and the scope of the big publishers, it's essentially a competition perspective on that. Uh, and this is a wrong way for a competition to happen with a big publisher and then lots of smaller fish that are relatively unorganized, uh, at least if, from a large global perspective. Uh, and it's difficult in order to compete with that. Uh, and this results in a lot of other issues associated with these sort of things. This is a better way of doing that where people get together, united, uh, we stand, divided, we fall. Uh, in order to be able to implement something uh, like this that's more federated, uh, you need to have a standard, you need to agree to the standard, you need to implement the standard, you need to be able to work cohesively in moving forward. The unfortunate thing is anyone who's been in academia for any period of time understands the difficulties of trying to mobilize academics and especially faculty in order to be able to work together in such a means. Um, uh, so this is not the current state of affairs, and I don't believe that this will be the current state of affairs for a long time. So we wanted to be able to try to pursue a better way in order to compete with that, and our idea is to build a bigger fish. In other words, build a centralized infrastructure, a warehouse of sorts, uh, but more powerful than just a repository, uh, that's able to compete with publishers. In order to do that, you need to have all the components that make the publisher's products replicated in the product that we're doing. So it's not just here is a textbook and here's a, a, a you know a printed copy of the textbook. Now it's online. Well, now this has to be online. Here's a homework system. We need to have a homework system. Here's a clicker system. We need to put a clicker system. Here's interactive molecules or interactive uh, uh, activities. Here's interactive activities in our system. Uh, and it becomes a, uh, a competition of sorts in order to who can build a bigger and more powerful fish, uh, and more importantly, uh, within the OER infrastructure, a free fish or nearly free in order to be able to satisfy our educational mission, which again is that because the costs of education, more specifically, the costs of textbooks and the ancillary materials around textbooks have gone up so high, they're adversely affecting our educational mission. So <clears throat> there are different approaches that we can use in order to address that. Uh, and the first one I want to talk about is a decentralized approach. A decentralized approach essentially argues that you have multiple local activities uh, across the uh, 
uh, across the country or, or across the globe. Uh, so you have, for example, on one campus, a server, and you have authors and adopters and students that all interact with that server for a specific campus. And then you have another server and another campus uh, that operates uh, within its ecosystem and another server that operates within its ecosystem. Uh, and then correspondingly, uh, you can get the point off of that. <clears throat> this right here is an effective way in order to uh, to address the issue of dissemination and ultimately uh, empowering this, this aggregation of resources necessary in order to compete with the commercial publisher. Um, Delmar, are you, are you planning on showing slides? You are not currently sharing your screen if that is. Okay. There that we go. <laughs> Thanks, Karsten. Um, was there a problem? Uh, are you? Are you not able to see my slides right now? No, I think when you exited the meeting because you're trying to do something, it stopped sharing your screen. But now it is sharing, right? Uh, no. No. Okay. Um, but I think this is actually good. Um, you should put the slides, but yeah, it's it's good that you can talk in general as well. Yeah. We okay. So can you see it now? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, there were visualizations uh, involved in this. <laughs> uh, so uh, this ap approach is really quite uh, popular uh, out there in many uh, examples of, uh, of implementing infrastructures. Uh, there are pros and cons to a decentralized approach. So uh, the pros off of that is it provides flexibility because you have control uh, at each campus in order to be able to implement what is necessary in order to customize the content for the, uh, the needs of the instructors, the needs of the students uh, on, those, on the campus. Uh, <clears throat> so that control is control over the servers that run the system, the technologies behind it. Uh, and some people argue is control of the pipeline in terms of information coming from those servers to the students, for example. Uh, I argue that unless you're talking about only information uh, that's being distributed from the server to students on a campus, you're invariably using pipelines that you don't have full control over. That you have ISP, you have to deal with Wi-Fi, and you have to deal with a lot of other infrastructure that you don't have control over. So therefore you're losing um, uh, a lot of that local control argument and the pipeline is, is largely a mirage uh, uh, argument. The, cons associated with uh, this sort of approach uh, is that it generates a fragmented ecosystem. So what one campus does uh, in advance is uh, on their, their specific infrastructure, unless you have a federated infrastructure in order to communicate from one uh, of these little balls to another of these little balls, uh, oftentimes content gets replicated. You reproduce the wheel. Uh, and, and that is one of the worst situations that we have here because we have to move forward in order to compete with commercial publishers, again, to achieve the goal that we uh, set out in OER in general. So uh, a fragmented ecosystem works against us. Uh, uh, it requires independent resources in order to operate. So every campus needs its own server uh, in order to have the own server. It needs its own IT infrastructure. Uh, it's its own uh, infrastructure for internet uh, access uh, uh, and the software uh, upkeep necessary in order to do that. And it's independently required in order to operate and that's inefficient. Um, uh, and that right there is one of the issues that we have here. That's one of the reasons why uh, software as a service or cloud-based technologies have advanced so much here is because this provides an opportunity in order to centralize the effort and make things more efficient in order to operate. The second one, or the last one here in the cons is costs. So, and this is not necessarily related to a decentralized approach, but decentralized approaches are enabled by using what's called FOSS or free and open source software. Um, and that is because it's free, you're able to distribute the code and you can run it as you want, as long as you pay for the appropriate efficiency costs of running their, your own little fragmented ecosystem on your campus. The key point here is that while the code itself is free, implementation is not. 
<clears throat> so free and open source software doesn't necessarily mean that it's free available in order to implement or free available for students to be able to capitalize. There has to be some resources invested in order to be able to make it work. And I argue that uh, it can be actually quite pricey, even though the code itself is free. Uh, the alternative is a centralized approach uh, for that. For example, you have a server, in this case here, it's a much bigger server because it has to operate at scale. And then you have all the individuals, all the stakeholders that are involved in being able to add, contribute, adopt, uh, use, whether you're a student, adopter, uh, or, or an author, um, and you centralize uh, off of that. Uh, so it has its pros and cons uh, out there. Uh, <laughs> so it's pros is it has high stability and fidelity, and, and that's because it's centralized. You have control over a single point in order to be able to uh, propagate the efforts of that point out broadly. Uh, it provides effective sharing because it's within a central infrastructure, um, and that is demonstrated, for example, with the remixing capabilities that we talked about yesterday, where you have content stored in our libraries, and you can pick and choose content and integrate it uh, together. If it were distributed across multiple campuses and multiple sites, it becomes a far more painful experience, or even uh, if it's hidden behind paywalls or sign-up walls, uh, an impossible experience in order to effectively share that content. Uh, and that uh, extends not just with the content, but also with the resources that you have available. So when you start to introduce additional technologies, you implement those at scale at the centralized point, and then everyone benefits from that. Um, and, and that's a, a lot of the examples of the uh, greater Libreverse that's going to be discussed today. And it's, it's efficiency. Uh, it has the greatest efficiency in order to be able to implement these sort of uh, uh, infrastructure. And it's enabled largely by the infrastructure of the internet uh, the, the, that we currently have today. So its con uh, is that it has lack of at least complete local control. Uh, so you have to rely on an external source uh, to run the servers, maintain the servers, and make sure they're all up and make it uh, operate. While it's efficient, it still uh, removes a little bit of control off of that. Our approach in order to try to address that is to provide that customization section on our system versus our uh, in the course hubs versus the bookshelves, which is uh, curated by uh, our development team. Uh, and then it requires costs, just like in the decentralized approach, because it's not free to implement in order to uh, propagate. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily require operating on with free and open source software. Uh, it can be software as a service uh, that you essentially pay in order to have access to, uh, which is quite ubiquitous because almost all of us uh, are on campuses that run uh, software as a service learning management systems where we export the uh, LMS operation to a company in order to be able to maintain it. Uh, and there's, there's reasons why we have switched to that. Okay, so uh, our infrastructure uh, is meant in order to try to take the benefits of both the centralized and the decentralized approach and bring it together in order to provide what I feel much more powerful cohesive, uh, and I believe ultimately the successful approach in order to address this issue of competition with the commercial publishers uh, and the greater educational uh, component off of that. Uh, <clears throat> so let me switch over to the discussion of uh, the Libreverse. Uh, so this ecosystem that we are growing uh, around um, our textbooks in order to be able to provide some value added component of that. So as I mentioned yesterday, uh, the, the Libreverse cons is, has the libraries as the core uh, of our content. And then we have these ancillary, and they're not necessarily small components that can spend a lot of effort building, of applications that surround it, they provide value added component to the textbooks. So it's no longer here is just a physical book that you can uh, adopt versus a like an online book or a book that uh, you'd be that you'd have to pay for with a commercial publisher. Uh, it provides a lot of these additional technologies necessary to build the textbook of the future. Um, uh, and that includes a query and notebooks and other things like that. I'm gonna go uh, around the cycle here in order to emphasize each of these points uh, and at least give you a topical overview of some of these things here. Okay, so one of the issues uh, with uh, uh, the, the infrastructure of the OER universe is, is fragmented. There's content found in a variety of different spots out there, the Open Textbook Library, OER Commons, Open SUNY, eCampus, Ontario, and a wide range of various uh, 
repositories uh, of content distributed off of it. So one of our efforts is to bring this all together into a centralized infrastructure that's in those libraries that you then are able to tap capitalize and use effectively. That is, again, one of our efforts, obviously, the the construction of an effective and powerful authoring platform is a secondary component on top of that. But that's the libraries. So what about the other components that we have here? Uh, these. Uh, so let me just talk about the uh, query and adapt system. I'm gonna give a little bit of an overview of here. However, the next presentation here that uh, Eric Henry and Mike will be presenting, we'll go into in more detail. But I just wanna give you my perspective of these things here. So. It's clear that we needed to build a homework system. Uh, we knew that we needed to do this 15 years ago or 13 years ago when we started the project, um, but it requires a massive infrastructure in order to implement, in order to build something that's online, robust, stable, sturdy, uh, uh, and has all the capabilities that you want with the system to, uh, to work operate, to operate at scale um, and comprehensively so we don't uh, replicate efforts across these things. So we're building a system that's flexible, dynamic, comprehensive, integrated, and LMS agnostic that is powerful off of there. And again, Eric, uh, Henry, and Mike will be discussing that uh, in, in a lot of detail. The key aspect behind this infrastructure is not to rely on a specific technologies. technology. There are a variety of technologies out there in order to, uh, that are enabled by modern technology, modern web technology uh, in order to provide online assessments. Uh, and, and you've probably heard of some of these things uh, <clears throat> like uh, My Open Math or H5P, which was discussed yesterday, or web work, uh, or even your learning management system has its own infrastructure for delivering assessments uh, that are out there. And the key point uh, off of this sort of uh, approach here is that if you have a decentralized infrastructure where you have resources, uh, and this is how we operate with our library, you have uh, various connections that are associated with this, with different students going to different OER resources. Um, we are tr the underlying the libraries is the construction of a, a, de a de facto abstraction layer, a mechanism in order to bring all the complexities of all the different resources and put it into a central warehouse with the same consistent format. And that's essentially an abstraction layer. It's an abstraction layer for distributing of content. But what we're doing is taking that same approach and applying it to the homework system, taking the benefits of not different OER resources, but taking the benefits of different online technologies and tying it together to a central abstraction layer that's able to um, act as a go-to spot for these different technologies. <clears throat> so in that case there, it simplifies the approach and the interaction between the students and the content uh, by going through this abstraction layer. Uh, so this is an example of, of this. Uh, like I mentioned, the three technologies are the first technologies that we're dealing with. One is WebWork, which is an online delivery system uh, that has been around for about 25 years uh, that Mike Gage initiated, I believe, in the middle 90s, uh, right when the web started up. Uh, and it's very... Uh, well used in upper divisional math classes and more advanced uh, engineering based uh, classes. IMath AS is a port from uh, web work that was then reconstructed in order to uh, focus primarily on lower divisional uh, math classes uh, by David Lipman. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with the term IMath AS, it's the same technology that underlies my open math and the same technology that underlies Lumen Ohm system and even to the same library infrastructure. So what we've integrated into our platform is essentially everything that's in Ohm uh, for you uh, without the commercial components associated. And then there's H5P, which is a different beast uh, that is a more graphical infrastructure in order to be able to add things together and move them in such a way that you can uh, it's not algorithmic, but it's, it's uh, again, visual uh, off of that. Um, and there are a range of other technologies that we want to integrate uh, into, uh, into this thing. So I'm going to uh, skip over this uh, briefly, other than saying that each of these technologies requires a detailed infrastructure in order to operate uh, independently, including a, a problem builder, a library, a searcher, an assessment system, an assessment checker, a grade book, and an LMS interface. And each one of the technologies are typically quite different from each other, and they have a different feel off of that. We are bringing these things together by gutting them uh, uh, and uh, 
bringing it all into a central system so that the technologies are relatively behind the scenes and that you have a common facade in order to address that. You can look and see these problems because we have 100,000 problems, online assessments already integrated into our query gallery, uh, which you can go to the URL that's available here and you can peruse those. Uh, it's right now based semantically based on the technology uh, and the search infrastructure is in place, but we're expanding that to be more comprehensive. So you can do a search and find questions irrespective of the technologies that are available here. I'm going to skip over the state of construction because I'm sure that that's going to be discussed uh, in the section after that. Let me go into the, the next component of here, which is the uh, annotation infrastructure. So integrated into our system is Hypothesis, uh, which is an annotated infrastructure that provides opportunity for students to provide individual notes, essentially marginalia. Uh, it can provide contextual chat rooms uh, for localized uh, groups, uh, and it provides an opportunity for community curation. Uh, so you can get feedback from the community community uh, uh, for comments or uh, annotations that are publicly available. We have a secondary system called Nota Bene, which is a precursor to hypothesis. Um, and, and if people are interested, we can discuss that uh, in more detail. But the key point is you can use uh, this as a mechanism in order to uh, provide annotations uh, in writing as if you were writing on your book. So this is an example of something public that David Great has made for this one textbook here. Uh, and uh, he highlighted different sections of that and just basically wrote in questions and emphasized the aspects of his notes that he can then review afterwards when he's studying for his exams. Um, and this provides a mechanism for students to come in, highlight something, and then ask their instructor, I don't have, I have a problem with this paragraph here or this section here. And this provides a contextual discussion around the textbook that to facilitate a greater in, uh, learning uh, for the students. Uh, <clears throat> the the next one I want to talk about is the Jupyter uh, notebook system. So we have a Jupyter infrastructure, which is essentially a technology that allows you to embed executable code. We have up to 30 different languages that we can embed, although only five or four of them um, are well used, including Python, R, Octave, SageMap. Uh, and it gives you the ability in order to embed code uh, into your textbook in order to uh, process this. This right here, uh, this very long URL, and I'll share the PowerPoint uh, after the presentation, is an example of my quantum mechanics class that I'm teaching right now. So it embeds a book, uh, or embeds uh, this code here, and we can actually hide the code. The key point is to, uh, it's important for educating STEM students nowadays to be comfortable with coding uh, in some form or another. It's a, it's a requirement that we need to uh, implement. So by integrating that into the textbook, you're essentially providing a mechanism for the students to get steeped in those codings. But it also provides a mechanism for students to interact with the code, run it under different parameters, and use it as a Socratic method in order to essentially uh, be an experiment. Uh, in this case here, this is a particle in the box uh, situation where the students can come in and put in different parameters and plot them up in different ways. Uh, you can then uh, add questions around these, uh, these simulations in order to guide the students in order to learn from the interaction with these, uh, this code here in order to be able to get this thing out. I am a strong supporter of this thing because I believe this is interactive investigations is exceedingly powerful for conceptualized advanced concepts so that you can uh, embed into it. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> there are other interactive elements that you can add to the system. Uh, and this is an example of a repository of interactive elements that are that is on the chemistry library. Uh, so as in technology has advanced, we add them into our library and this becomes essentially a candy store for faculty to pick and choose elements that they want to inter build into their pages of their textbook in order to advance things. It's a little bit less powerful than the uh, Jupyter Notebook system, but it provides great flexibility in order to show individual concepts. So for example, interactive proteins, interactive uh, molecules, uh, visualization of three-dimensional structure, but we have FET simulations and a wide range of other technologies that we have integrated. And we build these things as learning objects for uh, or facilitate the collection of these things uh, for uh, constructors and adopters in order to build more advanced textbooks. That is the textbooks of the future. Um, 
Uh, I mentioned learning analytics as an infrastructure in order to be able to guide how students interact with the textbook, how they interact with the homework system, and provide feedback directly to the uh, instructor of record in order to uh, uh, provide intervention capabilities or to guide their pedagogy and identify uh, if their educational activities truly is getting into the students' brains. Uh, that's going to be coming out later on uh, this academic year. <clears throat> uh, we've been collecting uh, things for a while. Um, uh, it, one of the utilities of having things centralized uh, is that we have the ability in order to implement code that addresses the, the content collectively. Uh, I mentioned the Brad bot, which is a, a, a bot that goes through this library of content uh, and it updates uh, and removes uh, code that's not up to a standard that we have uh, established. It's largely superficial. It doesn't manipulate code itself, um, but it man manipulates how things uh, look. That's why we chose Brad Pitt as the pretty version of that. The next version of that that's going to be running, uh, or it's in its initial stages of running, is then the uh, accessibility bot that goes through and starts to implement modern accessibility protocols that we can, that a bot can do that doesn't require human intervention in order to implement. And this is only powerful and only implemented at, uh, at scale when you have a centralized infrastructure. A fragmented, decentralized approach, this wouldn't be able to work. In fact, a lot of content, even on specific technologies, uh, are aged and, uh, and don't work uh, in such a way. Um, we can embed into different learning management systems because learning management systems have the advanced learning management systems have the capabilities of uh, entering in uh, content. Uh, we can store our content into uh, these things. I'm gonna skip over the philosophy of these things and basically argue the technologies that we have in order to put content in from the Libreverse into the learning management system can go via two technologies. One is what's called common cartridge, uh, which basically downloads content into a file that you then upload. And the other one that is in its initial stages mm -hmm. of development is uh, learning uh, tools interoperability or LTI, which gives you the ability in order to transfer information, for example, grades um, uh, from the LMS to our homework system and, and adaptive um, and analytics infrastructure uh, and such. So uh, I mentioned that we uh, are building, I mean, the key component of our mission is a community. Uh, so in order to facilitate the community, we've been constructing forums in order to guide uh, either uh, large conversations uh, for construction efforts uh, or localized conversations around certain topics uh, in order to facilitate that. We're still uh, haven't scaled it up to the level that we want, but we're planning on uh, implementing that uh, when we start to build in some new technologies around authentication of our infrastructure. So that was meant to be a medley of different components of our Libreverse. Uh, I will end the, the discussion with what I started, which is essentially our mission statement. We're implementing a community-built OER resource platform portal that's comprehensive and can be curated at multiple levels. In order to push this forward uh, for uh, OER means that we're building the textbook of the future. And that means that you need more than just distributing uh, uh, text-based contents or PDFs. You need a massive infrastructure in order to provide a powerful learning platform that students can engage and interact with and advance the educational mission of the, the, the course, the instructor and the department. With that, I will uh, end the discussion. Uh, I think I saw some uh, chats uh, fly through and I can certainly address any questions before uh, the next session.